So I want to talk to you today about the uh, mysteries of Christmas. And whenever I read in the Gospels about the birth of Jesus, I always ask a lot of questions and some things I understand, some things I don't quite understand. And in my introduction, I mentioned a scripture from the prophet Isaiah who prophesied probably 800 years before the birth of Christ and several things that he said. But one thing uh, that uh, stood out to me when I think about the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah said in the 55th chapter, verses 8 and 9, I'm going to read to you, it says here, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, said the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so many times when I read about God and look in, in the Scriptures, I have to come to understand that you cannot understand the Bible and look at it from a scientifically point of view or use some of the other uh, thoughts or some of the other uh, things that we are familiar with in science and politics and uh, psychology and all these different things. And oftentimes people try to put God within their box of logic and how, you know, things should work out. And many times even in our lives we Maybe have an idea we're praying and saying, Lord, this is what I would like to see happen. I would like to see um, this world change and transform my life, take a different path. I like to see, um, as I pray, uh, relationships renewed, healing take place. And I, I know when I get with pastors, we often talk about a revival. Uh, what is God saying and doing in the earth today? And maybe have a an idea of what we'd like to see happen. But as, as I read the scriptures, and even as I look at the story of Christmas, uh, the way God worked things out and, and the way he did things is so illogical, so unreasonable. And uh, it seems like we get fix, fixated on seeing how something's going to be worked out and resolved, and then God does something totally different. I mean... We all had plans that we want to see happen. and We have plans. We want to see things work out in our lives. And then well, God would come in as we pray. And uh, sometimes the way we prayed and thought, it doesn't work out that way. But God's way is always the best way. And so I'm looking here at the uh, birth of Jesus Christ. And I just want to refer... Uh, to the recording here and what it said in the book of Matthew, which was ideally written for the Jewish mindset. And beginning in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, this is how the birth of Jesus came about. His mother Mary was pledged or engaged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace or possibly something that was capital punishment in those days. He had a mind to divorce her. And he did want to do it quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home and for her to be your wife. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She gave birth to a son. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus. Because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. They will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. Now, you think about this. Here's this young couple. I, I, you know, I mean a young couple. I, he was older than her. I, I, they estimate maybe she was around 16 years of age. And if you're following along in my notes... I entitled that one section we're talking about right now, Joseph's Dilemma. Now, they were engaged. They had plans. Just like many people nowadays, we have a plan what we hope and think this is the right thing to do. This is what I plan to do. And then, it's interesting, all of a sudden, something happens. God visits Mary and says, you're highly favored. And tells her that she's going to be, she's going to conceive and be impregnated and have a child. But it will be of the Holy Spirit. And you think about what's happening in this day and time. Now, just reflect back. You see the writings of Malachi the last book of the Old Testament. And it says there something prophetic that God will send Elijah and uh, that he will come and turn the hearts of the children to the Father and the Father to the children. There will be uh, a renewing, refreshing work of the Holy Spirit. And then the Old Testament closes 400 years of silence. Nothing. The interbiblical period. You don't see... God speaking prophetically or anything happening in those 400 years. There's nothing recorded. Then all of a sudden, here God begins to move. And he takes this young woman who's engaged and speaks to her and tells her that she's going to be con conceive a child of the Holy Spirit. And then... You see how these events unfold. And when Joseph realizes that she's pregnant, he says, what am I going to do? His solution is to divorce her and put her away privately because he loved her and didn't want to shame her. Now, thinking outside the box, what are they going to say to their parents? What's the explanation they're going to give to the people in that community. And when she gives, well, she says to her parents, he says to his parents, says to the community, Mary's pregnant, but it's by the Holy Spirit. Do you think they believed him? Do you think anyone, when did they think, when did they finally resolve their mind that this really was of God? After the child was born five years later, 10 years, 20 years. I, how many people you think believed this couple? Very few. You know, look at our lives and things that happen, and we say, well, I remember when I went to my high school reunion. They found out that I was a minister of the gospel. They didn't believe me. <laughs> I mean, they, they saw my track record and how I conducted myself. And if you want to know more about it, I don't care. Ask my sister. She'll tell you the truth. I'll lie, but she will tell you the truth. I mean, you think, you think you're in control of your life, don't you? Now, if God is not in your life, that means the hands of God are not up on you. And you might do well in this world. You might succeed in, as, as the world identifies you as being very successful and prosperous. But you come to the end of your life and you enter in eternity without a Savior. There's no hope for you beyond the grave. And so we have this young couple 
going through what is probably a pretty normal thing, getting engaged, getting married, raising a family, and then all of a sudden this big interruption. You know, if God is going to work and move in your life and use you in, a, in an awesome way, don't you think he'd make it easy? Huh? If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, don't you think everything would just kind of fall together and get all your ducks in a row? Everything work out perfectly? You love God, you're faithful, you come to church, you give your tithes and offerings, you read your Bible, you try to live a holy life, and then all of a sudden, issues, problems, things you didn't think would ever happen. What, and then when all of a sudden you find yourself in a boat, but you're going down the river and it's smooth, and all of a sudden you hit white water, and I mean, you're just holding on for your dear life. You say, God, where are you? What is happening here? Why all this? You know, a lot of people become atheists, agnostics. And one reason is because they can't put their head around pain and suffering. At my high school reunion, I talked to this uh, of the classmate, and he said, I read the Bible. And he went on this diatribe explaining one of the Old Testament books in a very perverted, ungodly way. And I saw there's no use in trying to argue with him, but what I understood through the sensitivity of the Holy Spirit in me, that he was angry towards God because somewhere in his life, There was a shipwreck. Instead of calling out to God and moving towards God, he moved away from God where he's angry. And anyone who identifies with God more or less was his enemy. He was hurting. And Mary and Joseph could have been in this situation. Well, God, I mean, you said I'm highly favored to you and... We're evidently living a righteous, godly life. Why put me in this situation where people now in my family and community do not believe me and are thinking the worst, and they're thinking fornication, adultery, immorality. Were they ever vindicated? Many times people will not understand you, will not agree with you because of who you are. You take a stand for that which is right. And unfortunately, in America now, true spirit-filled believers are in the minority. But if you're one with God, you're in the majority, if you know what I'm saying. See, The important thing is not so much what the world thinks because the world's going to try to do away with God, embrace evolution, humanistic reasoning, and say, you know, Christianity is just an escapism. It's just for you to deal with your issues in life. There's no such thing as God. Our young people who graduate from high school, they're going into the military or going to college, you're going to be challenged with your, in your faith. You're going to be challenged with what you have been taught and believe. You're going to be challenged and the people are going to come against you who are very smart, who think they got all the answers. You're going to attack your faith and religion from a scientific perspective philosophically and say things to you And if you don't have a sure foundation, if your life is not built up on a rock but built upon sinking sand, you're going to collapse, and then you are more likely will embrace that ungodly mindset, and you will drift. You'll drift. You see, the things of God cannot be understood from a logical, scientific, reasoning intellect. It requires a faith, relationship, and trust in God, even when it doesn't make sense. 
What do you mean conceived of by the Holy Spirit? What kind of weak, flimsy argument is that? You knew and you need to confess that you were unfaithful and you took advantage of this young woman. And young woman, you gave in to this man. I want to say a majority of us here probably have done things similar to that, but I want to say the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all your sins. Hallelujah. Every single one of us have dropped the ball, done something, if not actually acted out in your mind, you've done things against the goodness and the holiness of God. I thank you that Jesus cleanses us from all our sins and all unrighteousness. I don't care if you've had an abortion or if you're divorced or you took drugs or did this or that or something. Whatever. We're all messed up. We all need a Savior. I remember when I started going to school in New York at a very prestigious school and required in literature classes to read all about these Marxists and all these so-called brilliant minds and study Greek philosophy and all that stuff. I want to tell you something. That garbage never really messed up my faith in Jesus. And I would see, and, and, and I would not purposely become argumentative, come back against that stuff. Or maybe intellectually I couldn't go nip and tuck with them, but when you get in the presence of the Holy Spirit and speak the Word of God, you can deal with those things because the world, just like in the day of Mary and Joseph, the things of the Spirit to the rational scientific mind seems foolish. And you could see the dilemma they were in. And they probably were th saying that Joseph and Mary, what have you been smoking? What have you been drinking? You think we're going to buy this? You see, that's where your faith is really tested when you know that you know that you heard from God. And you know that you're born of God. And what you're doing is the right thing. And then everything else is against you and everything else against you, then you find out, do you really have faith in God? Do you really trust Him? Can you stand against the attacks and accusations of the enemy as He works through people? And then you know, what I've got is more precious than gold and silver. And God comes and works and speaks into your heart and life. Now here's the wonderful thing. In spite of this situation, that this young couple at the first Christmas had to deal with all this accusations. You know they were being challenged. God intervenes. Hallelujah. God comes. And Joseph has a dream. And in the dream, the angel comes and said, Don't worry, this is the right thing. It wasn't somebody else, Joseph. She belongs to you. And this is of the Holy Ghost. He needed that. He needed God to come and intervene and come along and shore him up and give him some resolution. To give him some strength because he was going to have a battle. Afterwards, when she's ready to give birth, puts her on a donkey and takes her from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. Would you like to do that? Just get on a donkey and travel here to go up to Jasper, Georgia would be tough for you, even if you're not pregnant. I mean, God, why don't you send down an angel and just pick him up and transport him? Why does God have to make things so hard? You know what I mean? You think about it. And then, couldn't find a place. They're looking for an end. The Holiday Inn said no. The Sheraton said no. Motel 6 did not leave the light on. <laughs> Ended up in a stable and laid him in a feeding trough. And then, to make things even worse, within a two-year period of time, Herod is threatened politically and says, there's another king 
I got to kill them. I mean, come on, Lord. We're serving you. Help us. Make it reasonable, Lord. And they had to flee to Egypt. They had to move from Atlanta to upstate New York where it's cold. God, why? What are you doing? You know, we complain and we get upset because our plan, our agenda has been disrupted. And, you know, our children rebel against us. Or tell us they hate us and don't love us. I've gone through all that stuff. You have too. Even in a job situation, God, what are you doing? I lost my job. I've been faithful and served there 30 years, and now they just threw me under the rug. We live in a broken world with a lot of broken people. That right there explains a lot of stuff. But here's what you need to do, what I need to do. We need to get a hold of an anchor. We need to get a hold of something that's sure and solid, that we can stand in the midst of a trial, a tribulation, a premature death, a final, uh, get a letter from the internal revenue. I get those things in the mail, and I go, oh, God, help me. I open it up, you know. And I go, thank you, Jesus. They owe me money. God, forgive me for being of little faith. Amen? And so, you know, here's, here's one thing that, or not in my notes, that I'm just speaking to you. When I find myself between a rock and a hard place, and you find yourself between a rock and a hard place, maybe when your heart's broken, or you feel rejected, all of a sudden you get a bad report from the doctor's office. Or you see someone in your family that you love and care for doing the wrong thing or going the wrong way, and your life is being turned upside down and inside out, and you're trying to find some understanding. You're trying to find, God, where are you in all this? God is faithful. And what he did here, and Joseph and Mary, both of them had dreams. Both of them had an angel visit them. And here's how I pray for situations. I, I have to start my day out, and I've got this mindset, the first hour of the day, I've got to spend with God. I've got to. I've got, I've got to open up the book. I've got to talk to Jesus every day. I'm not concerned about myself because I know that God has marked me, but my concern is for many of you and other guys, other pastors I know in the city who I got to know who are opening up their hearts and saying we need men like you, older seasoned men to come and, and to help us and speak in speaking to our lives. And then my family members and I say, God, what has to happen that these loved ones we're concerned about, I, they need an encounter with you. They need for you to visit them. They need for you to come and speak to them. Maybe in a dream, a vision, through a circumstance, or some situation, a light shine upon them. Think about the Apostle Paul. Sincere. People think, I know I'm doing the right thing because I'm so sincere about it. I know this is the right thing. Listen. You don't know right from wrong until God comes and intervenes in your heart and life and he shows you what's the right thing. He shows you the truth. I know that's what happened to me. I had a plan. It was a good plan. I was going this way, then God intervened and changed my whole educational preparation and training and put me on a different course. But he came and he visited me, spoke to me, marked me, and I said, God, I thank you. I know that I know that what I'm doing doesn't make sense. And people would say to me in those early days when we hadn't been married that long and had two little girls, and I made a 180 in my life and left my career and what I was doing at that time 
I went a different way. I had an uncle said, are you out of your mind? I said, no, I'm in my right mind. I didn't plan to be here. I didn't plan this church. I didn't plan to buy the... I, and I see the hand of God. I see one miracle after another. And so, I, I, and when, I, when I read this story and I see the dilemma that they're in and the difficulty, and in the midst of that, I see God working. Now, here's something that has helped me. In Roman numeral three, I say this, the Holy Spirit works in the lives of believers, listen, to guide, to teach, and instruct them. There's a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to read this to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I read this on discussions with other pastors and I'm starting to get a handle on it, but there's still some things there I just quite have not grabbed a hold of, spiritually speaking. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. Now, when I'm talking about how the Holy Spirit guides us, teaches us, and instructs us, instructs us is that something you can find in a book necessarily? It's not something you can find in a course. It's not something that's necessarily taught in a seminary or Bible school. But listen to this. Eye is not seen, nor ear is heard, nor mind hath conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by the Spirit. For you to understand spiritual things. It takes the instruction of the Holy Spirit to come and speak and enlighten you. We're totally dependent upon God. I mean, you can, I, I've known people who studied the Bible from an intellectual point of view, but just spiritually speaking, never really grasped the truth of God's Word. He says, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, and we may, that we may understand what God has freely given to us. This is what we, we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words, or teaching us by comparing spiritual things with that which is spiritual. Now get a hold of that. What in the world does that mean? Huh? What does that mean? Is, what he's saying, the Holy Spirit doesn't do it the way you learned in school. It's not something you get from the wisdom of men. He says the Holy Spirit instructs, teaches us, and guides us by taking and comparing spiritual things with that which is spiritual. And I said, what? What does that mean? How does that work? Where can I go and get a quick class or instruction on that. It says here, the man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. The intellectual, rational mind will never understand things of the Spirit. It's impossible. You know what the natural man, the natural man is the man not born of God. You know what he'll say? This is a bunch of hooey stuff. This is foolishness. Just like that philosopher, professor, at Utica College in upstate New York. That is the weakest thing I ever heard. Your Christianity is escapism, is based upon a false precept, is not factual, is not logical, is a bunch of hooey. The natural man cannot understand the things of God. He's always going to say, it doesn't make sense, it's impossible. 
This doesn't happen. That's what was happening in the day of Joseph and Mary. This doesn't add up. Come on. Be honest. You were messing with her. Come on. No, no, this is the Holy Ghost. Who's the Holy Ghost? Now, 400 years of silence. Who's the Holy Ghost? What are you talking about? Did you see what's going on? Now, try to stand in your faith after all that ridicule. It goes on to say, The world says it's foolishness. They cannot understand them because they are, these things are spiritually discerned. The spirit man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now, if you're sitting out there and you're saying, what in the world are you talking about, preacher? You're having difficulty comprehending this. It's not to belittle you. Or it's not to say that you're not in tune with God. It doesn't say that you're not a believer. What we have to do, we have to earnestly seek after God and say, Lord, as it's spelled out in other writings of Paul to the church of Corinth, that for us to be able to embrace the things of God, we are totally dependent upon God for him to enlighten us and give us understanding. You can't, you can read until you are worn out, but unless the Holy Ghost comes and visits you and speaks to you and gives you revelation knowledge, you won't get it. We are totally dependent upon God. Now, I'm meeting on a quarterly basis with some like-minded pastors, and what we're seeking God about, we've got to hear from God. And, and some of these guys are, I mean, they're sharp. They're brilliant. Well educated. And I'd say the majority of us have master's degrees and maybe a few PhDs. But you know what? We sit down and say, what is God saying and doing and how can we effectively disciple people? I don't know. I know the strategy, but how to do it. You know, you can't make anything happen unless God does it. I don't care how smart you are. You know, I, I, I'd like to see this place packed out every Sunday. Now, I, if we get out there on the marquee and I put out there, we are giving away a new, not a used, I'm not a new car, a new used car. And you come in and sign up and we'll get a ticket. And we'll draw, I will pack this place out. We'll pack it out. Or I, we get up there and I say, okay, we're going to have a new worship. We're going to have our worship team be like Hillsong. Or what's the one of those other, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, singing groups that does a great job. I want to say the Grapes of Wrath, but that's not it. Oh, guess it, casting crowds. You see, I'm into all that stuff. You know, and we could have this big thing and bring someone in, and we would pack the place out. But after they're gone, guess what? We fall back to where we were. You see, to me, in understanding what God is doing in the midst of a difficult situation in this young couple, what God is doing See, in the earth today, in our church today, the thing that I want to see and believe will really not just attract people. We can find ways to fill the place up, but what we need is the presence of God. That lives will be changed and transformed. They'll come in with a skeptical mindset, being critical, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost falls, and then they have this angel that comes and visits them, or God speaks to them, or grabs a hold of them, and then they say, God, I am so unworthy. I'm lost. I need help. Save me. You see, we say, well, the poor man needs Jesus. The rich man needs Jesus also. So, 
when I look here in the scriptures, and it says the things of God, the things we're talking about, the way the Holy Spirit teaches us, comparing spiritual things with that which is spiritual. First of all, what is spiritual? If you're born of God and you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're a spiritual being, a new creation. That is spiritual. Amen? You can't buy it. You can't earn it. It's something of God. He comes. He marks you. He calls you. He saves you. He gives you everything. He gives you the faith to believe. He gives you repentance. He's a Savior. He convicts you, calls you. All you do is say, yes! That's true about everything. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, having an encounter with God, a worship experience, everything. We are totally dependent upon God. Now, spiritual things. Being born, he takes something in metaphors that we understand, born of the water and of the Spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. So, a spiritual thing, being born... Of what is being born of the water? You, have to, you understand the Word of God in Ephesians 3.20. It says, born of the water. It's the washing of the Word of God. The Word of God renews and washes you. It's an ongoing process called sanctification. Being born of the water, the Word of God comes, deals with us, convicts us, changes us. We say, God, help me. Born of the Spirit. Things of the Spirit of God. Salvation. When I got saved, when you got saved, I didn't get a contract written in the blood of Jesus that said, this is the guarantee. Show this at the gate so you can get in. It's a work of the Spirit. People said, prove to me that what's happened to you is true and real. Prove to me that God exists. Here's my proof. What this book says has happened to me. I experienced it. It became real. I understand those spiritual things he's talking about, regeneration, being born of God, being saved. Understand those spiritual things, and then I see, okay, God, now I understand I am that spiritual being and how you compare those things and how it becomes a reality in my life. The parable of the talents. 10, 5, 1. He's talking about something that we identify with money, a talent, a measure of wealth. Gives five. I mean, 10, 5, and 1. And the spiritual thing he's talking about is not that you got a lot of money in your pocket. He's saying, if I give this to you, he says, are you faithful? In that parable, Spiritual thing. He's teaching us, those who are spiritual, we understand, yes, God, I understand. You want me to be faithful with everything you entrust into my heart and life. So he says to Mary and Joseph, I have done this miraculous thing. It was a miraculous thing. And you're going through a trial and tribulation. Will you continue to love me? Will you continue to walk in righteousness? Will you do the right thing? We raise this little boy in the love and admonition of the Lord. And they did it. With a cloud hanging over them, they did it. Now, here's a revelation God gave me this past year. Remember all those sermons I talked to you about the persecuted church? Remember those sermons when I talked about the heavenly man, Pastor Young, who suffered tremendously? And where he was in prison, and the, they turned the entire cellmates against him, where they urinated on him and threw feces up on him and told him he was foolish, and where they were just, they beat him and tormented him, and he would not renounce his faith in Jesus. He would not strike back. He didn't become a reactionary, and he loved them. You know what? Over a period of time, what he suffered. He turned that whole prison to Jesus. He loved his enemies. That, that takes, 
That's being spiritual. And so here's what the Lord said to Matthew chapter 10, verse 24. He said, Is the disciple above his Lord? Is the servant above his master? The answer to that is no. If you're going to serve God, just as Jesus suffered, you may have to suffer. Just as Jesus was persecuted, you may be persecuted. Just as Jesus was misunderstood, so you will be misunderstood. If you live a godly life, the Bible says you will suffer persecution. I used to think my theology was, oh, I'm going to serve God. I won't have to suffer. I won't be persecuted. Oh, he's going to give me all the cattle on a thousand hills and all the gold and silver. And everything's going to be hunky-dory. I'll never have to because God is the anchor of my life. God's my refuge, which he is. So, Joseph and Mary, because of their dilemma, I believe it catapulted them right into the arms of Jesus, right into the arms of God Almighty. They were able to endure and pass through. And I think both of them, now Joseph evidently expired early in his life. But Mary is right there. Could you imagine her son on that cross? Going to the cru- she did not curse God, turned against God. She finished life well. I believe Joseph finished life well. Jonah, I don't think he did too good. Solomon, I don't think he did too good. Ahab, he didn't do too good. Judas, he didn't do too good. But there are a lot of them who did and finished. David finished well in spite of his problems. You could take any, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the whole lot of them. Continue to put your faith and trust in the Lord. And so what he says here in conclusion, not only are you spiritually born of God, but you have the mind of Christ. So here's my word of the Lord to you in conclusion. If you have the mind of Christ and you are dealing with a difficult situation where no one understands you and thinking the worst, here's what I say to you. Be patient if it's filling in the blanks. Secondly, we must understand that the Spirit of God is interceding and working in our behalf each and every day. And here's what I know. We must realize that all things work together for good to them who love God Here's the condition, love God, who are called according to your purpose. That's a big difference there. His purpose. Now, some of you right now are in the midst of a trial or tribulation. I mean, your faith's really being tested. Maybe not so much you, but maybe a child or grandchild or a good friend. I have a high school classmate who put on Facebook, he said, I'm in hospice care. He was the man on campus. He was the B-M-O, big man on campus, high school. Basketball player, this, that, you know. And I saw him this summer, spoke to him. I asked him about a mutual friend who had a sudden heart attack and dropped dead. And this friend of mine and also his was exposed to the gospel as a young boy. His dad and mom His two sisters were believers, but this dear friend of ours who knew and heard the gospel of Jesus Christ said this to God. And I said to my friend Ray, I said, did Gary make things right with God? Did he bend his knee, confess with his mouth? Now, as far as I know, this friend of mine I'm talking to right now, I'm talking about He never did any of those things, as far as I know. 
And he, he said to me, he said, I, I, I don't know. It was a sudden thing. He was on the golf course and he just dropped dead. My age. And then I find out this friend of mine I'm talking to, this big man on campus, he's in stage four cancer. And he's open and transparent, but I emailed him back and I said, this to him, not trying to be preachy, I said to him, thank you for being open and transparent. And I'm praying for you that God will have mercy on you and that he will reveal himself to you and you have an encounter with God that he will change your life. That he will change your life. And that you will have hope beyond the grave. He said, thank you. Now, I would love to just fly up there and sit down and have a time with him. But unless the Lord opens that door, that won't happen. But I'm believing and praying. And so what I'm saying to you is that in a situation like that or in the things we contend with, when we see things that don't make sense, they're illogical. Why, Lord, are my children or grandchildren in this mess? And I have to be patient. I have to believe that the Lord, the Spirit of God, is interceding and working. And I believe that God, because we love God, are called according to His purpose, that He'll work those things out. Amen? Because here's what happens. Every person... At some point in time, through the day, they're busy, they're preoccupied, but then they come down at night and they lay their head on a pillow and want to fall into deep sleep. The Spirit of God never slumbers, never sleeps, and God can come down even in a dream, even in a vision, or that still small voice grab a hold of them and give them something that they cannot buy or earn, and their life be changed and transformed. Can you say amen? Please stand.